Hello everyone, welcome to this month's episode of Tudor Talk and for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sarah and I'm the Tudor Travel Guide and of course we are going to be joined by our guest for the month, that's British historian and author Nicola Tallis and she is going to help us learn about one of the most formidable and omnipotent characters of the uh, Tudor era and that of course is Margaret Beaufort. So we'll be getting into that in a moment but first of all as ever let's do a little bit of housekeeping and have a chance to say hello to all you lovely people who are already giving me the thumbs up so that's great I can see you there and we've already got some folks saying hi so as ever I love to hear from you, so if you are tuning in live from wherever you are in the world, do say hello in the chat, let me know your name, where you are in the world, and in a moment I'll dive in and have a look and see who's in the house tonight. Okay, but in the meantime, let me just say uh, one or two little things. First of all, um, for those of you who don't know and haven't been here before, this is a my a QR code for Instagram and uh, I'm doing a lot on Instagram at the moment so if you are on Instagram but you're not yet following me the Tudor travel guide then please do all you need to do is take your phone on the camera hold it up to the uh, QR code and click and it should um, send you the link through to Instagram but don't leave me yet you need to stay here for our chat okay so um let's see who's here so let me see so Susan, Susan Sackett, I had the opportunity to hear Nicola in London in December 2019. We flew in that morning and con and convinced the hotel to check us in early. <laughs> Excellent. Well done. Fantastic. There's a fan. Hello, Janet from Canada. Yes, lovely to see you again. And uh, Mikado7. Hi, Gail. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. Um, so, yes, so, so um, Gail is saying, so interested in Margaret's life and legacy, the peril she and Henry lived through. Love to hear about France. Thank you, Sarah and Nicola. Well, thank you for joining us. And hi, Sandra. Sandra in Collie Weston. Yes, I've got the right Sandra, haven't I? Um, looking forward to hearing from you. I think perhaps, Nicola, maybe maybe you know each other. So, um, because obviously there's been loads of wonderful digs in Collie Weston looking for Margaret's house. So um, what are you saying there? Uh, looking forward to hearing from uh, Nicola. Had our ground penetrating radar survey done last week on the Palace Gardens, just waiting for the formal results, but it looks very interesting. Ooh, that's amazing. So just for those of you who don't know, there has been a project at Collie Weston, which of course was the site of one of Margaret's houses, to look and find the place of the, the original house. And that's ongoing. Thank you, Sandra, for that update. Hi, Margaret and Debbie. Lovely to see you from Northern California. And we've got Lane. And um, yes, I've answered that question, Lane. It's the Palace of Collie Weston. Very pertinent to tonight's chat. Cindy, Joanne. Oh, my goodness. There's loads of you here. Loads of you. Thank you so much for tuning in. I, 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 what I want to do, though, is make sure that we crack on and we make as much time as possible for Nicola to be able to chat with us. But I will be keeping an eye on the chat. We have an hour together as usual, so we'll be wrapping up just before six o'clock. And, um, and uh, so um, what I would love you to do is once we get into the chat, I'll ask Nicola a couple of questions. And then of course you can start asking your own questions about Margaret Beaufort and about Nicola's research for her book, which is of course titled The Uncrowned Queen, The Fateful Life of Margaret Beaufort, Tudor Matriarch, indeed she was. So without further ado, let me welcome Nicola to the show. Hi Nicola, lovely to see you. Hi Sarah, lovely to see you too. Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, you're most welcome. And look at us both. We've got actual daylight happening. So this is a time of the year in the UK, isn't it? When things start to lighten up and we see summer on the horizon. What a relief. Oh, it's wonderful. It's blissful. <laughs> I'm loving the sunshine. So Nicola, you're a British historian and author, and you've treated us to a couple of, well, actually now three bios, haven't you, about some sort of major players in Tudor history. We have Lady Jane Grey, loved that book, by the way, uh, Lettuce Knowles, and then, of course, your latest book on Margaret Beaufort. Um, and, and your interest really is the 14th and 15th centuries. Uh, yes, that's right. No, the 15th and 16th century. That's right, isn't it? <laughs> 
That's right. Yeah. I, I mean, I absolutely love them because there's, as you know, there's so much going on at that time. How can you not be interested? There's war, there's tragedy, numerous executions, blood, guts, <laughs> romance. <laughs> it does have disposing it of wives <laughs> it does it does, it so. really does and I was learning a little bit more about you that I didn't know before today and that is you we we share a love of bling a love of Tudor jewelry so I didn't know that that was the subject of your thesis though it was and it's still really the subject of ongoing research I would say it's very much a passion of mine and I was fortunate enough to to study the jewel collections of the Yorkist and early Tudor queens for my thesis and I was just encapsulated I still am it's it's just it's incredible and I'm only sad that we don't have more surviving pieces to tell us more about these incredible yeah. queens that were living in this time that's a shame but yeah Yes, because they all got, most of them got broken up, didn't they? Either reused or lost in the Civil War. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, what a shame. What an incredible collection those women had access to. And oh, just to, just to be able to see one of those pieces would be a dream come true. But as you say, uh, mostly broken down and, and recycled or sold off. So uh, none surviving that we know of today. Well, that is another topic, I think, for another time, because I certainly could talk about Tudor jewels for a good hour or more, that's for sure. But we are here to talk about the subject of your latest book. And just by the way, folks, uh, if you haven't already bought Nicola's book on Margaret Beaufort, I have put links to the UK and US Amazon links to her book in the description below this talk so that you can easily click on that and find a copy and pick up a copy uh, as we go. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick us off with a couple of questions, Nicola, if that's okay. And then we will, as I say, folks, start uh, posting your questions and I'll be sure to keep an eye on the chat and um, I will be posing as many of your questions as I can to Nicola. But let's, let's kind of start at the beginning and it's a combo, I suppose, of... Um, I was really interested in why you chose Margaret Beaufort and then maybe the other sort of side of the coin is is why was she such an important figure in history and in Tudor history in particular? Yeah I mean I if I'm being completely honest it was my editor rather than me that chose Margaret <laughs> because originally I came up with another idea for a book and I pitched that and my editor said that's great but have you thought about Margaret Beaufort because there's so much interest in the White Queen and uh, and the Red Queen and, you know, uh, she's being talked about a lot and there are lots of things that are being said about her, you know, was she the mother-in-law from hell? Did she murder the princes in the tower? All of those sorts of controversial topics. And and it did, when I, when I went away and thought about it, it did seem like there was a real gap in the market for a biography of Margaret because there hasn't been a fully comprehensive one for some time. Mm. And um, so, so it seemed like a really good opportunity to tell her story. Although I must admit to begin with, I wasn't feeling massively enamored by it because I had this image in my head of just this quite dour and quite dry little old lady basically and I thought oh is there going to be that much to tell and it was wonderful I can honestly say that I think it was probably it was certainly the most challenging of my books but I think also the most rewarding in many ways as well so um, so that was how I, I came to write about her and and that was why we chose Wait. Margaret. And may I ask you, because you said such a couple of things there, I can't let them go by, really. You know, <laughs> what made it so challenging? But I'm always interested in how authors develop their relationship. And having written about folk myself, you may have certain preconceptions about people, but it's amazing once you start to get under the surface, they come to life and then you develop a relationship. So I'd love to hear about how your relationship with Margaret developed and and, and before we get sidetracked to almost go to the end in some ways and say, you know, where were you when you started and where were you when you finished in terms of what you felt about her? Yeah, that's a really good question, Sarah. So I, um, as I said, to begin with, I, I didn't 
I didn't necessarily have any preconceptions of Margaret in terms of the White Queen and the Red Queen. I wouldn't say I'd been influenced by that at all. Um, I think I, I very much took it with a pinch of salt and accepted it for what it was, drama and, and fiction. Mm. And uh, But I didn't know if Margaret's story would be particularly interesting or particularly appealing. And I think I was very fortunate, or we are very fortunate, that given that Margaret was a woman living in the 15th century and the first decade of the 16th century, there is a really rich variety of source material available, which tells us about her life, including in her own hand, we've got quite a lot of letters and papers that were written in her own hand. And this is, I mean, for anyone writing about the 15th or 16th centuries, um, this is like finding a pot of gold, really. And <laughs> just incredible to have that opportunity to work with all of the primary sources that relate to Margaret and her life. So, you know, we've got things like, uh, we've got her well, several copies of her will, we've got letters, we've got her household accounts, there's all sorts. And um, I think it was just, it was a real privilege having the chance to, to work with those sorts of materials for starters. And, mm. and so it did paint a very picture, uh, sorry, a very different picture of Margaret for me as I was researching. And I did develop this relationship with her, which was, you know, I think it's fair to say Margaret is very controversial and she inspires either love or animosity. Um, and I think actually when you look at the source material, you just see that she was just a normal woman in many ways. She was human. She had the same flaws that we all have. And, you know, she had some wonderful, wonderful strengths and, and qualities as well. And so I think by the time that I finished the book, I came to I came to really admire her. And I also saw a different side of her in the, again, we sort of think of her as this very pious woman, which she was, but she she also loved to have a good time. She loved having fun and she loved being entertained. And it was really nice to be able to see that less serious side to her character as well. So I think that there was a lot to like and a lot to admire about her for sure. Well, that's, that's a really fantastic answer. I love that. I'm feeling warm. I'm feeling more warmth towards her already. <laughs> um, bef we've already got a great question. Just before I ask that, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit and ask you, at her worst, Margaret Beaufort could be dot, dot, dot. And at her best, Margaret <laughs> Beaufort could be dot, dot, dot. How would you finish those sentences? Okay, so at her best, Margaret Beaufort could be a loving mother, grandmother, friend, and employer at her, oh, and benefactress, I should add. Mm -hmm. At her worst, Margaret Beaufort could be grasping and she could be ruthless on occasion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I often wonder whether in those times a little bit of ruthlessness was a prerequisite to getting on in the world. <laughs> I think anyway, so. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, so I'm going to deviate because we have had a good question. I think actually might be appropriate to us now. So Kerry, thank you for this. I'm going to drag your question onto the screen and hopefully then for Nicola can see it for herself. Where did the theory of the involvement in the disappearance of the princes in the tower come from? Was it just Richard III Franz trying to deflect? <laughs> um, great question. <laughs> um, do you know, it's something that's been popularised recently in um, Philippa Gregory's The White Queen and The Red Queen, that she was, uh, that Margaret was involved with the disappearance of the princes in the tower. Um, but the actual, the actual first mention of Margaret as having been involved in some way with their disappearance comes from the 17th century. So it comes from, you know, a century after her death basically, which I think I always say that that's, that to me is the most compelling evidence of her innocence, because I think that had she been involved in some way, then there would have been some contemporary hint or mention of it. And, 
and the fact that there isn't that at all I think is is probably quite revealing so yeah it's a theory that has been around for a long time that has but that has been popularized in popular culture in recent years whose agenda was it to push that um, theory in the 1700s I think the first mention of it came now you've put me on the spot (laughs) I think the front (laughs) can't remember everything all the time I was just wondering I was thinking "Mm, who would who would be bearing a grudge at that particular point or maybe it was Uh, just maybe it was a historian just trying to you know sort of go stir it a little bit (laughs) I can't, yeah, do you know, I can't, it's, it's on the tip of my tongue and I can't quite remember who it was that first put that about, but they suggested, I think that, that Margaret had perhaps tried to, I think that they'd suggested she tried to poison the boys, uh, um, but, uh, you know, again, yeah. there's no sort of indication as to where that story came mm. from, so, right, um, right. quite okay. telling. <laughs> Yeah, and, and actually, we were talking about Margaret's character. Um, and actually, Beverly's asked quite an interesting question here. Thanks for this, Beverly. And I'll pull it onto the screen again, because, again, you can then see it for yourself, Nicola. Margaret has been played on screen by Amanda Hale, Michelle Fairley, and Harriet Walters. Did any of them match your own feelings about Margaret? Um, I must admit, I haven't seen I haven't seen the latter, the latter one. Sorry, it's gone now, but that I haven't seen the one that was Harriet... Walters, Harriet Walters. Walters. Okay, so I haven't seen that one, so I can't comment on that. Um, but as to the other two, no, absolutely not. The Margaret that I came to know, I suppose, in some ways through my research, didn't match either of those actresses' depictions. <laughs> which, which were they in? Because I can't, I can't. I'm terrible at matching actresses' names to what they yeah. were actually in. <laughs> So, um, so Amanda Hale was played Margaret in The White Queen, oh, and Michelle right. Farley played Margaret in The White Princess. I think oh. that's correct. I'm not sure about Harriet Walters. Right. Well, maybe no, Beverly, they, if you know if you know Beverly about Harriet Walters, you can put that down in the comments and let us know. But that's interesting. Yeah. So, let do you know t- the person who I think? Oh, sorry, I was just no, going to no, say no. the actress who. The actress who I most closely identify with being Margaret is, um, what was her name, Marigold Sherman. Um, I think that's her name, Marigold Sherman or Sharman, who played Margaret in the 1970s series at Shadow of the Shadow of the Tower, that's it, which is all about the reign of Henry VII. And, um, and I think it's, it's well worth a watch for, for all Tudor fans, but I think she was the actress who came closest to the Margaret that that I think of. In the shadow of the tower, that sounds interesting. I've never heard of it. And you rarely see things on Henry the Seventh. So I will I will definitely see if I can and find that. That that great recommendation you need to get that yeah thank you and uh, Beverly was just uh, oh Jamie was just telling us Harriet Walters was in the Spanish princess there you go oh okay okay. I've not watched that yet no I didn't get that now I'm really quite obsessed with um, understanding um, people's early experiences and why they then become the person they do so what what were the forces do you think that shaped margaret's life early on that 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 created the character that she would become as an adult well what i think is quite interesting is that from very early on in life margaret learned some quite important lessons about the unreliability of men if you like because she was just a few days short of her first birthday when her father died. So she never knew her father, really. So that's one important male figurehead who's, who's gone. And shortly after, she becomes the ward of William de la Paul, who was the Earl and then Duke of Suffolk. And he's rather brutally executed, uh, again, when Margaret's quite young. So uh, she wouldn't have known him very well, if at all, to be honest. We don't know for sure. But Again, that's another male figurehead that's gone. Mm -hmm. And and the same when she comes to marry Edmund Tudor when she's 12 years old, you know, she becomes pregnant very shortly afterwards, but Edmund dies before she gives birth. So I think that losing these male protectors, if you like, from an early age 
made Margaret or forced Margaret to grow up very quickly and to stand on her own two feet. And, you know, we see this with her is that the the times that she was she was living in, you know, very tumultuous times at the time that she's born, England is close to uh, close to the beginning of the Wars of the Roses. By the time she gives birth to her son in 1457, England is in the throes of the Wars of the Roses. And I think, mm. you know, all of these experiences really forced her to to assert herself and to, to grow up very quickly, as of course did becoming a mother at the age of 13. So I think she was very much a product of the age in which she was living in and was very much shaped by the events in which she was she was forced to um, to live through as well. So yeah, the, the instability of the times no doubt had a profound effect on her, I think. And right. um, yeah, yeah. And you've talked about some of uh, one of you know her marriages there, and some and um, Laurie, Laurie, that's a great question. Do you feel that any of Margaret's marriages were actually love matches or became love matches? I don't think that any of them were initially made as love matches. Um, I think it's quite difficult to gauge exactly how Margaret felt about Edmund Tudor, for example, because we the marriage was so short and uh, unfortunately we just we don't know a great deal about it but I do think it's quite interesting that Margaret chose to be associated with Edmund for most of the rest of her life but arguably that may be with the benefit of hindsight you know the fact that he had co-created the first mm. tune with her so it's mm. it's difficult on that front I do think that even though her marriage to Henry Stafford who was the second son of the Duke of Buckingham I do think that even though that was made also for political considerations that in personal terms this was probably the most successful of Margaret's marriages as well and I think that even if it wasn't a true love match, there was certainly a great deal of affection between them. And, you know, they regularly celebrated their wedding anniversary oh, and they spent yeah. a great deal of time together. So I think that that probably hints at an affectionate relationship, if not a hugely passionate romance. Yeah, yeah. OK, well, that's that, that's kind of nice to know. I like that. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the questions, you know, one of the things I think most people associate with Margaret was her dogged, apparent pursuit of getting Henry on the throne. And certainly that's how it was shown in The White Queen, for example. <laughs> now, 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 this yeah. is what I want to ask you first. Was she really that obsessed with 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 that? Um, can you just put, unpick that for us and give us a more a real flavour of, 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 of her proactivity in that and just how how obsessed or not she actually was? And has that been blown out of all proportion by popular media? In a word, yes, <laughs> it has. I'm she... glad I asked it that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she it has been blown out of proportion. I think this idea that from the moment of her son's birth Margaret was was determined to to push him onto the throne and believed that it was his god-ordained right to be there is it couldn't be further away from the truth because at the time of Henry's birth really he didn't matter to anybody apart from his mother he just wasn't important and it's very clear that in the early years of his life, Margaret was doing all that she could to try and keep him safe. And when Henry fled abroad in 1471 in the aftermath of the Battle of Tewkesbury with his uncle Jasper Tudor, some sources suggest, and I, I think in this case it's probably quite accurate, that this was done at Margaret's urging. And I think you know that was very much with an eye to his safety. And it's very, very clear that during the reign of Edward IV, all that Margaret was trying to do was to work for a way to um, bring her son home to live in safety. Um, and we can see this, you know, she she's busy trying to negotiate with Edward IV um, to, to find a way whereby Henry can do this. And she's pretty successful because Edward IV goes as far as to draft a pardon for Henry, and it still survives in the archives in Westminster Abbey. 
But then, rather inconveniently, Edward IV dies unexpectedly in 1483. And this throws Henry Tudor's fate into uncertainty and, well, indeed, the fate of the whole country into uncertainty with the events that followed. You know, first there's Edward V and then he's deposed and then Richard III sets himself up as king instead. And within a very short space of time, it, it, Margaret has taken up arms against Richard III. So I think what had happened was that um, perhaps Richard III hadn't been so accommodating as his brother in in offering terms whereby Henry could return home, because it's very clear that it's the onset of Richard's reign that triggers a change in Margaret's mindset. And prior to that, no, she just wants to keep her son safe. After that, it becomes something different. Well, that's that's just so interesting. Thank you so much for setting the record straight there. That's 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 great. Lovely. Um, now, I'm just looking at the chat here and uh, Gail, you've asked, I'm going to pull this on screen again. So she ended up mother of a king and a new dynasty. How improbable did this seem, say, 20 or 30 years before? And was it her action that made it be or something else? We might have we might have covered some of that in that. Anything else you wanted to add to that? Um, no, I think probably it's just important to, to reiterate that um, during the reign of Edward IV, we've got to remember that Edward was, to all appearances anyway, a healthy and strong king with seemingly two ma male heirs to succeed him. So the Yorkist dynasty seemed pretty solid and secure. So there was no reason to think that Margaret had any ambitions of you know, putting her son, who nobody heard of, nobody knew who he was, onto the throne at this time. Wow, yeah, interesting, fantastic. So um, Margaret was obviously, once she had, um, you know, established herself, she was an incredibly powerful woman, wasn't she, in her own right? And I was kind of interested to explore with you how how kind of her life and all the power that she had and the independence contrasted maybe with what you might expect from another aristocratic woman. Was she pretty much the same as, or was she singularly different, uh, particularly, of course, once she'd become the mother of the king? And, 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 and how? How did her life perhaps differ from the ordinary aristocratic woman at court? Yeah, she, I mean, she certainly was different. She... From the moment of her son's accession, she was determined that she was going to be there at the forefront and that nobody could miss her. Everybody would know that she was the king's mother. And, and that's why she immediately takes this title of my lady, the king's mother, by which she's styled for, um, for the entirety of Henry VII's reign. And very, very quickly, she takes steps to assert her authority, I suppose, if you like, and, and consolidate her power. Because in the first parliament of Henry's reign, which is a few months after Battle of Bosworth, she is declared a femme soul by parliament or a soul person. And this really gives her full and sole control of her estates and the power to act independently of her husband, who by this time is Lord Stanley. And this is a really bold brave move in fact it's pretty much unprecedented because femme sole status was um mm -hmm. was usually only afforded to to single women so again this this really serves to underline the level of power that um, henry was prepared to allow his mother all by reason of him becoming king so um so that's a really really important move um, and there weren't any other women in the kingdom at this time who were, you know, who were given that privilege of, of being able to control all of their own lands because women were, of course, considered to be the property of their husbands or their fathers. So this is really, really extraordinary. And, you know, equally, the fact that Henry later appoints his mother basically as his unofficial lieutenant in the Midlands, um, where she operates from Collie Weston, uh, with her authority stretching into the north as well, that's something that's completely unheard of as well. So she does have she does have a lot of power and she does have a lot of influence. And what we don't know, unfortunately, is how much influence she had politically. Um, you know, at the heart of of the 
at the heart of affairs at court and how much influence she had over Henry. It's sort of been suggested mm. that perhaps she was this dominating, you know, overbearing mother. But I think, I think that Henry the Seventh was a strong enough character, you know, that he was very capable of making his own decisions. And perhaps he might have sought his mother's advice on occasion. We just don't know. But I don't think it's true or accurate to say that she was there. You know, she was governing, governing the realm and, and telling him what to do as such. Oh, that's interesting, because I was actually going to ask you that question, you know, what the real nature of that relationship was. So Henry was still very much his own man, it, it seems, but we don't really know the details of that relationship, you're saying. Yeah, I think on a on a personal level, the relationship was very, very close. And again, Margaret's been criticised for being this almost constant presence by Henry's side and at his court. But actually, if you put it into context, then I don't think that that criticism is fair at all. Because mm. we have to remember, this was a woman who she'd missed out on on raising her son primarily you know she she'd been apart from him during the wars of the roses he'd been exiled and she didn't really know him so the fact that he was now home he was now king i think it's perfectly understandable that she wanted to be close to him and you know and equally if he didn't want her there she wouldn't have been there so i think um I think it's very easy to criticise Margaret for, you know, being being there all the time. But actually, that's a reflection on on Henry's um, on Henry's wishes as well. And we do know that in some of the royal palaces, their apartments were so close that they even had adjoining chambers so that they could visit one another secretly. So again, it's another hint at a, a close relationship. And they did seem to have this, this quite close bond on a personal level. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I think, you know, I think that they were making up for lost time, certainly in a personal capacity. Oh, that's really good. And we've got a few questions here about sort of relationship stuff. But just to clear up oh, yeah. a point of order, Mary was asking, Mary, I thought queens generally were also given the femme sole sort of status. Is that not? Yeah, that's not true. Case, or it is true, right? No, that is true. Yes, sorry, I should have clarified. I was thinking that as soon as I said that. Yeah, no, that is true. Fem um, sorry, queens often were. Yes. Okay. Now, back still on the notion of relationships, we've had another couple <laughs> of questions about that. So, uh, T is asking, can you tell us what kind of mother-in-law Margaret was? <laughs> Um, I can try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is probably the question I'm asked most frequently. And there again, there's this depiction in popular culture that she was the mother-in-law from hell. And I, again, I genuinely think that that's very unfair. And the evidence for this actually only comes from one source, which is a report by the Spanish ambassador in 1498 which, you know, hints that there's some discord between Elizabeth of York and Margaret. But actually, all other evidence, and, you know, there isn't a great deal, but all the other evidence that we have suggests that Margaret got along rather well with Elizabeth of York and was very, very fond of her. Um, you know, they, they founded a chantry chapel together. They worked together to, um, to petition Henry VII not to allow... Um, Princess Margaret, Henry VII's eldest daughter, to go to Scotland for her marriage to James IV too early. Mm. And I think it's fair to say that, you know, in the same manner as, as today, if you spend a lot of time with somebody, then there are going to be times when they get on your nerves. It's natural. <laughs> and so it may well be the case that Margaret did annoy Elizabeth from time to time. Um, and I think, you know, perhaps this was the case when the Spanish ambassador picked up on on some tension is that they were just having a bad day. And unfortunately for Margaret, it's something that's been used to um, to go against her, her good name, I think, in many ways. But we don't know a great deal about the relationship. But what we do have suggests that actually they were quite close and they got on quite well. 
Right, okay. And actually, you've sort of answered somebody else's question. So I don't know your first name, but HJ Personal Trainer sounds like just what I need right now. Um, was saying, I'd love to know more about Margaret's relationship with her granddaughter, Margaret Tudor, before she had to go up to Scotland. So the, the, the kind of the relationships with the grandchildren, what do we know about Arthur, Henry, Margaret, Mary? You know, what, what, what evidence do we have? She, Margaret was a doting grandmother to all appearances. She seems to have absolutely adored her grandchildren. And yeah, the Princess Margaret, who was her goddaughter, she seems to have been particularly fond of. But it's quite interesting. This was a, a real, um, one of the wonderful moments for me when I was researching the book and I was studying Margaret's accounts, which are in St, the archives in St. John's College in um, Cambridge. And you can see all of the lovely little gifts that she was buying for her grandchildren on different occasions throughout the reign. So, um, so Arthur, um, I think it's fair to say that along with his parents, really, she wouldn't necessarily, Margaret wouldn't necessarily have known him that well because, of course, he's sent off to, to Ludlow um, and doesn't spend a great deal of time at, at court with his family although Margaret's still very fond of him and we know that she bought clothes for him on at least one occasion uh, Margaret yes yeah, she's very very fond of and again there's a reference in her accounts to her purchasing uh, gifts of brooches for Margaret and her younger brother Henry future Henry VIII of course Henry, she seems to have been pretty fond of too. When Henry becomes a teenager and starts to take an interest in jousting, it's his grandmother who purchases his first jousting saddle for him. Oh. And <laughs> equally, she, she was also the godmother of Prince Edmund, uh, who was styled Duke of Somerset in honour of, uh, you know, the same title that Margaret's father had had as well and sadly he dies very young and mm. again to all appearances Margaret seems to have been devastated by this and there's not a great deal of, of evidence for her relationship with Princess Mary but we do know that they spent some time together um, in 1506 when they were organising an entertainment at, at Croydon which was a palace then that Margaret was renting for some time so so yeah to all appearances she was a very doting and very loving grandmother nice nice well I, I want to change tack a little bit now we've talked a lot about relationships and interpersonal relationships in the royal household but you mentioned the word word benefactor early on or benefactress <laughs> um, yeah. she was really um an important benefactor of a number of different sort of i i think colleges etc Perhaps you could talk to us a little bit, therefore, about that side of Margaret's character. And does that link into her, her deep piety and religion, or is that something different? Maybe you could explain that to us. Yeah, I think it's a bit of both. I think um, suddenly, when Margaret became the king's mother, she suddenly had all of this additional income at her disposal. And she did, of course, enjoy fine foods, fine clothes, fine wines, all of those sorts of things. But I think she also sought to do something more purposeful and more meaningful with her wealth. And, you know, this wealth and her position enabled her to, to do something um, long lasting, I suppose, uh, for the benefit of others, which she took full advantage of. And she set about, we know now that she founded two Cambridge, um, sorry, two colleges in Cambridge, St. John's and Christ's. And um, I think education was something that she had always been really, really passionate about. But she hadn't had, she herself, even though she, we think that she'd probably had a fairly decent education, we know that she could speak and write in French. We also know that she regretted the fact, for example, that she was never um, she was never taught enough Latin. And I think that perhaps she perceived that she wanted to do something to give others the opportunity to learn and perhaps others who may not have had the opportunity to do so in normal everyday life. So yeah, she sets about founding Christ's, which is founded in 1505. And again, there are, um, there are numerous 
references to the building of Christ in her accounts. And we know that she goes to visit Christ and visits Cambridge on several occasions in the latter years of Henry VII's reign to check on the progress of the building. Um, and, you know, that she's, she takes a keen interest in who's admitted to the college. St. John's isn't established until 1511, two years after Margaret's death, but with her, you know, her money and her knowledge, basically. Mm. Um, and, you know, yeah, she does also, she also sets about doing things like patronising printers, which again is another, reading was a, a huge interest of hers. She buys huge quantities of books. So that's, again, sort of reflective of her interest in education. Um, and, yeah, she does also uh, found several chantry chapels as well, which is a reflection of her piety, mm. definitely. Well, thank you for Gail, because Gail inspired me to ask you that question, because she was asking about kind of Margaret's legacies and what was her uh, attitudes to education. So I think you, you've answered that and explained some of why maybe she was so committed. And am I right in saying, if I remember rightly, at the Jubilee Galleries in Westminster Abbey, you can see one of Margaret's books. I think you can see it's velvet bound. Book, you can it's her prayer book do you know I got to hold that just before mm. well I don't know <laughs> shortly before it went on display it was oh, that was amazing <gasps> yes so you can you can see that and you can also see her uh one of her traveling chests as well on display okay. there and so. actually what, just while we're talking about that um and I will get back to the questions in a minute but while we're talking about sort of artifacts that are associated with Margaret what would you say are some of the most interesting buildings or things that you can see that are associated with her still that have survived? Well, yeah, okay. So, well, yeah, obviously there's Cambridge. You can go and visit Christ's College and you can see Margaret's statue and her coat of arms proudly adorning the gatehouse. And the rooms that were used by her when she stayed there, you can also go and see those. So... Uh, so I definitely recommend that and and also St John's even though she didn't actually visit there it's still it's still a wonderful place to see Westminster Abbey of course where you can see Margaret's absolutely beautiful tomb that was carved by Florentine sculptor Pietro Turigliano that's absolutely beautiful so I would definitely definitely recommend that um it's amazing um just trying to think what else there is there's so much that's sadly not there any longer um there's a little bit left actually at the of the palace at Woking which was Margaret's famous sorry favorite home um and she spent a lot of time there in particular when she was married to Henry Stafford mm. and unfortunately it doesn't really convey the magnificence now that she would have no. once enjoyed while she lived there but it's definitely it's quite an evocative site so I would definitely recommend a visit there too I think yes I think so I've been to Woking myself yes there's not too much left oh, but actually no. yes you can stand there and if you know the history of it I think then you can you can let your imagination imagination is a wonderful thing and it can take us to some incredible places Definitely. Anyway, back to the comments, because again, I'm not sure of your Christian name. Mamalax3 uh, says, plan, uh, Margaret's plans for royal childbirth specify details for how pregnant women would spend the last part of the pregnancy and labour and childbirth. Do you know the basis for these detailed rules? So it's a good question, because that's another thing we often associate Margaret with, her, her protocol for childbirth. Well, it is, but we actually don't know if Margaret was responsible for putting those rules in place. Um, so, yeah, yeah. In, in fact, that they were probably, they'd probably been established prior to Henry VII's reign. And, uh, yeah, it's possible that Margaret had, had taken an interest because she was one for etiquette and she liked protocol. But there's actually no evidence to suggest, to suggest that she was actually responsible for for ordering those to be drawn up so oh. <laughs> important well, you go. to say busted, that you've busted another myth <laughs> That's we, like, we like a bit of myth busting well thank you it's Marsha thank you Marsha for just typing into the comments your name there and for asking us and actually Lucia Lu, Lucia is it Lucia uh, because I can see you must have an Italian name there 
a Lucia. A Lucia. I hope I've got that right <laughs> anyway. Um, so, um, yes, her famous portrait, because obviously there's that iconic portrait of Margaret, isn't there, in her, you know, yeah. looking very pious, etc. When was yes. that painted, by the way? Was that contemporary to her life or was that a later? Can you tell us about it? It was. Do you know, it was contemporary. And I, I can't remember the exact date now, but I know that there was, um, I, I think it was, maybe 2018, 2019, that there was um, tree ring dating done on, on the wood panel on which it was dated, which showed that it was contemporary. So um, so we do know that it would have been painted in Margaret's lifetime, which is really interesting. And of course, it's, it's on that portrait that most, if not all of the other likenesses that we've got of Margaret were based. And um, it's very possible that this was done on her orders and that this was a very deliberate depiction so this was how she wanted to be remembered as pious but also as as wealthy because she's wearing this black dress and that was also intended to signify her wealth because black dye was the most expensive dye available so you know so anyone who is anyone will be wearing black at this time also because it you know it did show status as well so I think yes it depicts it depicts Margaret's piety accurately but also her status. I'm surprised in some ways there aren't more images of her because obviously she didn't have a dramatic downfall you know she was very much a revered character uh is there just yeah. one um in fact in fact um Lorraine has asked it I've also seen a portrait of her of her younger i.e looking younger with a gold forehead cloth is this authentic um without seeing it i'm not 100 percent sure the only the only likeness that i've seen of a younger margaret which it's included in the um in the picture section of my book i really wanted to have it on the jacket jacket actually but um for one reason or another we couldn't use it and it's a stained glass of margaret and it was originally in um in wimble minster where margaret's parents are buried it's now in land beach church in cambridgeshire but it's absolutely beautiful and it does it does show a younger margaret um with a daisy or a marguerite in her hand which was margaret's symbol and i think that that's really helpful in terms of seeing you know, or getting a, a feel for what a younger Margaret may have looked like. Because again, thanks to the portraits, we do only really get a sense of her as a an older lady. Um, but yeah, without seeing the one with the gold, I'm not quite sure which one that is. Um, but most of them were copied from this one portrait um, that, that I mentioned that was contemporary. Most yes. of the ones you see now. Right. And, and I notice where the time is ticking by. So I'm just thinking of the last uh, few questions. If you've got any other questions you really want to put to Nicola, do make sure to ask them. And um, and I will try and squeeze at least one or two more in. Um, but while we're waiting, maybe you could tell us about the end of her life. Um, do we know how she died? and where she died. And I think somebody was asking about where she was buried. You mentioned her tomb, but maybe you could talk a little bit about maybe her internment and how that came about. Yeah, of course. So um, it's quite sad really, because Margaret's son, Henry VII, dies in April, 1509. And, you know, Margaret rushes to be by his bedside at Richmond Palace at that time. And I think it must have been unbearably painful for her the fact that she realized that her son was going to predecease her um and what lots of people don't realize is that she basically then acted as like an unofficial regent when henry VIII succeeded to the throne for the first couple of months you know she was there trying to ensure that it was a smooth succession, which of course it was, and you know, basically handing over the reins, making sure Henry knew what to do. And um, she attended Henry's joint coronation with Catherine of Aragon in June 
1509. Um, and she partook in the coronation banquet afterwards in Westminster Hall. Um, but this was the last occasion on which she'd ever be seen in public, it was the last occasion on which she'd ever see Henry VIII. And there was one report that said that she'd, she'd basically been, um, she'd got food poisoning as a result of eating a signet at the, at the banquet. Whether that's true or not, we don't quite know because she had been in poor health for some time now. Um, you know, she was suffering badly with arthritis and she had numerous ailments at this point. So, so we're not quite sure if that's true or not. But she retired to the abbot's house in Westminster Abbey after the coronation. Mm -hmm. And on the 28th of June, Henry VIII turned 18, so reached his legal majority. And it is so strange because it's almost like that happened and Margaret thought, OK, I've done my bit now, job done. And very sadly, she died the next day wow. at the age of 66. Um, and her friend and confessor, Bishop Fisher, who most people will remember as being executed by Henry VIII for denying royal supremacy, he said that her death, um, at her death, all of England had cause for weeping. And she'd known that she was, her end was approaching for some time. And she'd been very prepared and very organized in terms of making her will. Uh, so when she'd made her first will some years previously, she'd wanted to be buried in Lincolnshire at Bourne, which, which was where she lived with her husband, Henry Stafford, and it had Bayford family connections. But um, she changed her mind. And when her son, Henry VII, made it clear that he wanted to be buried in Westminster Abbey, in the Lady Chapel that he had begun creating, Margaret's wishes changed as well. And she decided that this was where she wanted to be buried as well. So uh, so arrangements were put in place for her burial in Westminster Abbey. And as I mentioned, the um, a Florentine sculpture named Pietro Torrigiano created her tomb. And hers was almost like the dummy run, if you like, because it was decided that if he did a good job of Margaret's tomb, then he'd be given the commission to create Henry VII and Elizabeth of York's tomb as well. And he obviously does an incredible job of creating Margaret's tomb. The face is probably moulded on a death mask as well. So we probably can gauge from this quite, yeah, yeah quite absolutely. an accurate picture yeah. of what she looked like. Yeah, which is remarkable. Um, and, um, and yeah, he, he gets the commission and and creates these wonderful monuments that we've got to the founders of the Tudor dynasty. That's a great explanation. Thank you so much. And I, I don't think I really just appreciated it was the day after, you know, Henry turns 18. Yeah. I knew it was very close. But yeah, there is that sense of, yeah, my, my work is done. And what a life yeah. she led. Wow. Yeah. Now, <laughs> we've got a few people asking about um, sort of, book related things so if you don't okay. mind I'm going to ask you a couple of questions so Jenny um, please ask Nicola if the book will be produced in paperback I want to buy copies for various people but the hardback is a bit pricey to do that thank you so what's the news um, on paperbacks it's so it's it's available in the UK in paperback at the moment in the US I I'm not quite sure it was released in the US in hardback last July so I would imagine that um, that that will have news on that quite soon. I'm I'm guessing that that perhaps you are in the US, um, in which case, yeah, like I said, I would think that we'll have news on that quite soon, and that will be available quite soon. Um, but I'm not 100% sure at this moment. I'm afraid. So it's just a little bit more patience, but I imagine yeah. it will come. That's the way it normally works, doesn't it, with publishers? So yeah, it, it normally comes out, the paperback's normally out about a year after the hardback. So, right. yeah, so hopefully, fingers crossed, I would think no later than the summer. Over the, over, Thank okay. You. So, okay, so um, Jenny's saying, no, I'm in the UK, Amazon only showing it in hardback. That's very Oh, nice. well, that's... Yeah, that's weird. Okay, I'm not sure. What about you could try the hive, actually. Um, if you have a, a look on the hive, um, I'm sure I know actually that they've got it in paperback. And if not, give me a shout by my website and I'll <laughs> I'll get onto it. <laughs> 
Okay, so, so so Jamie, thank you for this. He says you can buy UK paperback editions on Book Depository with free shipping. So the Book Depository ah. is is a good place to go. So there you go, Jenny. You might be able to find it on there. And um, Jamie's actually asking, he's actually saying, I absolutely love all your books, Nicola. Any clues about the subject of the next book? Can you give anything away at all or is it all top <laughs> secret? Oh, that's really kind. Thank you. Um... What can I say? <laughs> it's got a bit of sparkle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, there you go. That is very cryptic. So that's going to keep you all guessing, <laughs> isn't it? Marvellous. Yeah. I love it. I love it. But the timeline on your book, when, when, when are you thinking that that might happen? It's a bit of a wait. Um, it, I think we're probably looking at 2023 now. Um, just because, you know, the pandemic, unfortunately, has held everything up in terms of getting to archives and libraries and things. So I think 2023 is is the next mm. deadline. <laughs> Everybody's got to be patient, patient, patient. So yeah. with that, we're going to just wrap up now. And I, uh, is there anything you want to um, let anybody know about in places they can find you catch up with you connect with you Nicola anything you want to say as I say the links to your purchase on Amazon at least are in the description below this video although as we've heard the book depository is a great place to go and pick up paperbacks that's a great tip but is there anything else you want to say in terms of how people can follow you or connect with you or anything that's up and coming that you'd like to talk about um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, Twitter, my handle is at Nicola Tallis and Instagram, my handle is at Historian Nicola. Um, I've also got my website, nicolatallis.com and you can leave me a message on there if you like and I will get back to you. Um, other than that, I'm just trying to think. I w I'm afraid you probably will see quite a lot of me in the coming months because um, <laughs> I'm, I'm catching up on everything that was postponed from last year. So hopefully I won't bore you all and <laughs> you'll be sick well, of the sight of me by the end of it. <laughs> well, it's been lovely today. I hope you have all enjoyed our chat with Nicola today because I I've certainly learned things about Margaret Beaufort. So thank you so much for enlightening us and for spending this hour with us we really really appreciate it Nicola thank you pleasure thank you for having me right so I'm just um thanks Nicola we'll catch up shortly but I'm just going to finish up today um by just saying thank you all for coming on first of all and spending the hour with us sharing your questions I'm sorry um, I try and keep up with as many questions as possible. It's not always um, uh, possible to ask them all, but I do try and capture as many as possible. So I just wanted to make a couple of little announcements before we go. Uh, first of all, you may have noticed, or just to say that my latest episode of my podcast has gone live today. That's all about Sudley Castle and the final months of the life and the shocking after death of Catherine Parr. So if you love your podcasts, you'll be able to get hold of that on most of the main Major podcast providers. Uh, just another shout about my Instagram here. Again, if you um, put your mobile on that, capture it, you'll be able to go through to my Instagram page and do follow me on Instagram. There's a lot going on around there. And you may want to know who I am talking to next month. So, in fact, it's a lovely Linda Porter who will be joining us to, in fact, talk about Catherine Parr. So that is going to be happening on Saturday, the 10th of April at the same time. So this is going to be... Um, this is going to be about the same time, five to six o'clock. And before we go, I just want to, because Nicola is still in the wing, so she can hear what I'm saying here. And I'm going to, um, so so Debbie, say, Debbie's saying thank you so much, um, Nicola. So thank you, Debbie. That's um, you're one of my patrons for my or my uh, channel members. So thank you so much for coming along and supporting me and my channel. If you are interested. I have a channel membership and you just have to find the join button on my home page if you're using a, a PC, you know, laptop PC. It's not always there on the mobile. Very odd, very odd. But thank you. So let me read a few more comments. Uh, so we've got loads of people saying thank you here. Um, uh, Helen, uh, Kiri saying thank you so much. Brilliant talk and we'll be buying the book and following you on Twitter. Gail's so excited about a book with Sparkle. We'll wait. Alan, Nicola and Sarah, thank you very much. A great interview. 
Lucia, you said it was with an S, not a C. I hope I got a bit close there. Thank you very much. Um, and Amanda, could have listened for another hour. Oh, gosh, and there's Catherine and Jamie. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you so much. And it goes on and on and on. I will be catching up with, uh, with Nicola at the end of this. So um, she'll be able also to see all your lovely comments afterwards. So once again, thank you for joining me. And we are just coming up to six o'clock. So wherever you are in the world, happy morning, happy afternoon, happy evening. Have a great day. And I'll see you next week. Uh, next month. Okay, bye for now.